Welcome to this video in which I want to talk about causality. This is one of the videos in the more philosophical uh, subsection of this overall video series on our successful future. Now, what do I mean by causality? Causality is mentioned here. So first, the question that we want to answer in this video, how can cause and effect be physically understood? What does it mean, actually? And as a cause, you want to regard an individual trigger or a small set of triggers, but a small set, inducing an effect which would not have happened if the triggers would not have occurred, irrespective of some consistent variation of the surrounding environment. Now that's how it's typically um, defined, so with an individual trigger, so something induces something else. I'm throwing a stone, the window is shattered, I'm causing the stone to fly, the stone flying causes the window to get shattered. It's an individual trigger, an individual effect, and that would not have happened if I would not have thrown the stone. Also with respect to some consistent variation of the surrounding environment, so if something else happens around that, it doesn't influence that, apparently. For some aspects, that will become relevant, especially if you are looking later on molecular level. And that's actually what we want to do directly. We, I want What I want to do, actually, I want to go through a variety of levels. Levels in us describing reality. And I would like to start on the molecular level. And for all of these levels later, I want to look at the different relations between the entities on that level and ask the question, does that induce a cause-effect relation? Now we have seen that on the molecular level, we observe deterministic chaos, which, where the molecules are continually passing through bifurcations, where we have seen that it's randomized and that actually it's divergent. So a small shift by any interaction directly leads to divergent future evolution in the molecular behavior. So we have a universal network of randomizing interactions. Not a single molecule causing any other single mole to be, molecule to behave in any way. So there is no cause-effect relation on that level. It's randomizing. And that's actually where we can say, of course, there are molecular interactions. But the behavior of a molecule is influenced by everything else as well. So it is not independent. That's the second half sentence of about causality in the, on the first slide. So that's the reason why we can now say, well, it's not independent of the rest, how a molecule moves, and that's why that is not causal. Now, for quantum objects, that's the next level, we can also observe what's going on there. There are two interpretations of the laws that we use to describe quantum, uh, well, quantum level, elementary particles and things like that. And that is actually the quantum theory. And there are two, as I said, two interpretations. It's on the one hand side, the Copenhagen interpretation. Well, first of all, one has to say quantum physics makes only statements about probabilities, how a system, how an element, particle behaves. And uh, Copenhagen interpretation interprets that such that that is only the thing that can be described. So that's the only thing that has a reality. So there is nothing more to reality than these probabilities. Within these probabilities, it's assumed that the system behaves more or less random, so no causality. The other interpretation of that is that actually there are so-called hidden variables. That is, it is assumed that actually particles have positions, they have velocities, there are laws on that level that we cannot grasp, but they are there that describe what's going on. And so they, the particles behave, possibly deterministically, and it's only our inability to observe that and to analyze that that leads us to realize only the stochastic behavior on that system. The reason for that is quite simple. It's usually de described such that, in principle, if we try to see what's going on on that small level, we have to interact with that. And that changes the behavior of the system so much that the outcome is no longer representative of what actually occurred at that lower small level. So because that level is so small, we cannot observe what's going on there because anything look with, looking with anything at that disturbs the system. But the issue with um, hidden variables is actually that it's assumed there is an exact reality behind this stochastic observation that we can make. 
In that case, actually, we have to assume that if there are even deterministic laws that govern that behavior, that the behavior is quite similar to that of the molecules as well. Also there, of course, everything will be influenced by everything else. Also there, gravitation applies, for example, so that also their deterministic behavior, deterministic chaos is to be expected. It's the same behavior as here. All the consequences, which in turn means no causality. So either if you use a Kaponhagen interpretation or if you believe in hidden variables, both ways, no causality. So it's either random or the deterministic chaos as for molecules, no cause effect. The next level I would like to look at is the macroscopic level. Now let's have a look at macroscopic objects. I show here some billiard balls. They are the a typical example used to describe macro the macroscopic level. And we have to be actually quite careful if you want to describe that, because if we look at the different levels that we have, then of course we can describe that on different levels. We can, for example, take the molecular view. We can say, oh, there are polymer molecules, they interact also where they touch, where possibly a hit is transferred from one billiard ball to the next, the molecules interact, and then due to these molecular interactions, the forces are acting on the neighboring molecules, so the second ball, then all the molecules there start to move in a certain way, transfer the forces, so to speak, until uh, well, all the molecules are moving. And then if we collect the information, we see that the entire ball is moving. So that would be the molecular level. On the other hand side, we can look at the ma real macroscopic level. There are entities that have a mass, and if we apply a force to that mass, the mass will move at a certain acceleration. Force is mass mal acceleration, just as an example for a macroscopic physical law. And there we can, of course, directly see well that applies to that irrespective of the molecules. It also is irrespective of the special shape the structure of the entities. And actually the structural level is then the next level because then on the next level we see these are perfect spheres. They are almost uh, moving, rolling frictionless on the billiard table. If they're hitting it's very hard material, it's almost an um, inelastic hit, so very ideal behavior. So this is the structural level also that there are colors, that there are numbers printed on that or immersed in that somehow. That's the structural level. On the material level, we have, so to speak, the physical laws describing only the entities on that macroscopic level. We have something else on that macroscopic level, that is the physical properties. This billiard ball has a certain density, it has a certain hardness. These are, of course, results of the molecular level, but the molecules can't cause that. We saw molecules can't be causal. So, but nevertheless, that this of course constitutes something occurring on the macroscopic level that this has certain properties. And there we see at the same time the properties, they are not caused by anything, they are not caused by the molecules, because I mean, um, there's not a single molecule causing that, so to speak. So there is no single cause for the physical properties. On the other hand side, for the interaction between two billiard balls, if there's a, if they hit, the force is being transferred, energy and momentum conservation is applied. There we actually realize that, well, force, well, for example, energy conservation, that's a law, and it just says what has been before is the same as is afterwards. The energy before is not the cause for the energy afterwards. Also, if we look at the force equals mass times acceleration, it's generally accepted that the force is not the cause for the acceleration. You can also think, well, I'm moving the billiard ball at a, with a certain acceleration and as a consequence I have to apply a certain force. So it's typically assumed that a physical law on this macroscopic level just describes the interrelation between variables that we can measure, that describe our measurements, so to speak, and this physical law just says if you measure that this is the re relation that you will find, period, nothing more. Which means neither for the physical properties on the macroscopic level nor for the physical laws there's any cause-effect interrelation. So also on the macroscopic level and not regarding structural things that will come in just a moment, nor on the molecular level, only looking at the macroscopic system individually, we see we have defined properties, we have physical laws, where the, we, that's of course all averaged over many uh, molecules, sure, so that's so to speak the larger view that we take, and we see neither of these things is causal. 
So there is cause and effect coming into play. In order to analyze that, I performed an experiment. This is a pan on, on, a, on the stove filled with a thin liquid layer of silicon oil where some aluminum particles, fine aluminum particles, had been added and some uh, charcoal particles. And I heat it up at a certain rate. And then we see actually after some time, I hope one can see that on the videos, um, one sees that there are certain structures forming. There's a so-called roll cell, a Benar cell, it's a Benar convection. So in each of these cells there is flow from the bottom, so we are heating from below. In the center of the cell there's an upward flow, then the, at the top level, so to speak, the flow is in outward direction, and then at the circumference of the cell it's a downward flow. And that creates these cells. And then of course the bottom goes back, so there's a circular flow in each of these cells which is driven, of course, by the temperature difference. So we supply heat from below, which is then, as one says that, dissipated into the air above. So these are structures and they are so-called dissipative structures because this energy is dissipated. And here we actually see something that resembles a cause. This cell cannot occur without the neighboring cell. So this cell is actually driving something here. This is causing the neighboring cell into existence. The first cell that occurs forces the, first the second neighboring cell into existence. So there is suddenly something on cause and effect. So we can say actually cause and effect relate to the structural level. One structure can cause another structure to behave in a certain way. Okay, that's one aspect. So we see that there have been our cells that teach us that structure also resembles something like information. We will see that in a little bit more detail in the, in the following. Structure causes effects in other structures and the structure on the other hand side, the structure in itself, determines the behavior of matter. That relates actually to our freedom of action because we will see that we are structures and we act in a certain way and our structure, so to speak, drives our, us as matter to do certain things. So structures determines the behavior of matter. We see that also here. And actually, it is such that the, in the Benar cells, it doesn't matter which silicon oil molecule is there. As long as there are silicon oil molecules, the structure can ev evolve and perform its causal effect on the neighboring structure. So it's no longer important which molecule is there, as long as there are sufficient molecules. So we see that on the structural level, we suddenly see causal interrelations between cause and effect. I have an additional level to that. I will work that out in a little bit more detail. There we can actually see if there is a memory, then of course we can remember those things where we want to go. The causes can be, so to speak, perpetuated, and that leads to convergent behavior, convergent causal interrelations, which then can in be interpreted as being intentional. I will explain that in more detail in the following. Before I do that, let me show you a second experiment, which is the so-called besluzov zabotinsky reaction. This is a petri dish in which a thin liquid layer is again uh, placed with some chemicals in there, and these chemicals are undergoing some reactions. It's actually a combination of fair various reactions where some of the components that are participating in the reaction have a, are, are carrying a color, so to speak, and so we see that uh, the, there exists a colorful structure, so to speak, circles and spirals, and also there we see the cause and effect. One circle at one moment causes, so to speak, the next circle into existence. One turn of the spiral causes the next turn of the spiral. So there is also cause and effect relation. Now, why do I show this? Well, actually, if we observe this, this chemical reaction that's ongoing, then after some time all the reactants will be used up, it will have been equilibrated, the overall process comes to a stop. But in principle, we can keep the reaction up if we are continually supplying the reactants and if we are continually removing the reaction products. So we could do that. And if we do that, we could run that process forever. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's important to realize that apparently we are exactly such a structure. So also we are a structure, of course we are a structure, and we are feeding in continually certain reactants that we use energetically to drive our structure, to build our, of our, up our structure. If we wouldn't have that, this structure would decay, apparently we would die. 
So only this uptake allows us to, to live and of course we leave the remainders behind. So we are a system continually adding reactants and continually removing products and that keeps us alive, that keeps us in existence as a structure. So we are exactly such a dissipative structure. Now, of course, our structure is much more complex than either the Benar cells or the cells that we have seen in the of zabotinsky reaction, apparently. Well, why? Apparently we evolved over time, so we started presumably out, or the first chemical reactions that we could see as a first start of life will have been of similar simplicity as the of zabotinsky reaction. Actually, those that are discussed are quite similar to that. Some auto, so-called autocatalytic reactions that occur. And then this evolved over time. Some changes happened, some accidental changes, until then a cell wall, something giving or separating that from the environment evolved and that uh, helped to well, reproduce in the end faster, more efficiently, until in the end we are a multicell organism that has a complex structure with all these things going on. So we are so complex because of this evolutionary process, which I don't want to discuss in this video in detail. But it's obvious, if you think about that, that such an evolution always leads to higher complexity because this is apparently more stable than a belusov zabotinsky reaction uh, or a Benar cell. So we see that again. And now the question is, of course, well, how about this upper part here? So we saw that now sufficiently. We are structure. As a structure, we can control matter, so freedom of action. Now, why can that be intentional? Let me give you an example. I'm a fan of this guy. So both photographs are taken from concerts of Helge Schneider. Helge Schneider is a musical comedian or comical uh, musician, whichever way you want to uh, call him. It's always fun to watch him. So whenever he has some concert nearby, I will try to visit that concert. And at a certain point in time, I, um, I, was, I got the information that he will give a concert. At that time I was working in Graz and he was giving an appearance on the Schlossberg in Graz. Luckily, my wife directly organized some tickets for that concert, so that was settled. On the other hand side, I mean, if you think about it, I could have got the information, information about that concert by different means. I could have received an email, I could have seen an, an ad in the newspaper, I could have heard something about that in the radio. In each time, independent of how the information got to me, I would have try to get the tickets and to be at the concert at that time, at that place and at that time. It's a convergent behavior. And of course, me being intentionally, me remembering, we saw what remembering actually means. Uh, we will see actually what remembering means in the, in the next video, I guess. That means actually that uh, that's important for us, so to speak, as, as being that we have that memory. And that means actually that, of course, we remember we want to get there and that in turn means that, uh, of course, if there are some difficulties, for example, tickets of one price class are sold out, so I buy a different ticket. Or the online shop doesn't work for whatever re way, a reason, I will try it the next day again or an hour later again. Or I will go to the physically to a, to a ticket shop to get these tickets. So we will have workarounds and that implies, of course, our memory together with this causality implies then the intentionality that we can follow a certain goal causally over an extended period of time. Now that's one aspect, that's the intentionality. On the other hand side, we have to realize, of course, that, uh, well, what's actually happening? We can observe a little bit more detail of what's happening. We see that actually from the computer screen, from the email, there are photons emitted which then hit our eyes. Um, if we look at the newspaper, we see also the light emitted, the colors emitted from the uh, surface of the paper, so to speak, hitting our eyes. If it's the radio trans uh, broadcast that uh, hits our eyes, it's also then mo air molecules that are moving in a certain way that hit our eyes. It's always molecular. And of course we know molecules can't be causal, so they can't induce in us causally that we develop that intention to buy the tickets. So it can't be a molecular effect. It can't be on the macroscopic level as well. So what is actually going on? It's apparent, it's structure. 
It's the structure together with this information. That is why information comes into play. It's information contained in that structure. Information meaning that that structure means something to us. In that case, information can also, of course also much more generally be defined, but in that case, this information means something to us, causes then something in, in us. So it's the structure of the die on the sheet of the newspaper, it's the structure of the appearance on the screen, it's the structure of the airwaves that are hitting our ears that actually induce us to act causally to buy the tickets. It's always structure, structure interaction, the structure of the information reaching us, us then to do something. So we indeed see it's causal, it's convergent, it's intentional, and it's always this structure and information thing that is relevant. Now we can step back a little bit and try to get something a little bit more abstract inside. And there we see actually that on the different levels, we are applying different laws to describe what's going on. That's, that's finally what we are doing. On the smaller scales, we are using quantum physics, even to well molecular level or some many molecules. Computer stimulations are performed up to small, uh, or of, to up to many molecule systems. Laws of physical objects are somewhere occurring, well, typically above the quantum level, but uh, up to the macroscopic level included, of course. Then we have the material equations. That are those equations that describe the hardness or the density of systems. They are applied on macroscopic systems. And then above that, all these laws don't apply anymore. If I want to describe how one structure influences another structure, I can't describe that with material equations. I can't describe that with laws of physical objects, so force times mass times acceleration. Of course, that applies in a certain context there as well. But why the Benar cell induces the neighboring uh, Benar cell, that is not described by that. And then the quantum physics also doesn't describe by that. So we we find new ways to describe things on that other level, on this higher level, so information and structure, and we simply, that's for us the cause effect relation or the intention effect relations that we have on these higher levels. So we see it all relates to our, us describing appearances in reality on different levels, that on lower levels we have non causal effects, and only on the structural level we have these cause effect interactions. One has to be very clear, though, this is Ernst Mach, a physicist and philosopher, and he stated in one of his books, there is no cause nor effect in nature. Nature has but an individual existence. Nature simply is. So nature doesn't care about, about us describing what's going on. It has, of course, the levels and they induce certain effects in the other things or certain appearances in the other things. But it's us who puts our description on top of that. And nature doesn't care about cause-effect, it just is there. Actually, with that nature simply is, something else is meant actually. The picture taken is that time does not actually proceed, time is just a variable, so to speak, and we can regard the existence of the universe over all time as a big block, so to speak, and time cutting only the time slices and these slices, so to speak, proceeding through this existing entity of the universe over all times. And that's why uh, that's what it states, actually. But we do not even need to take that view. Independent of that, we can say that actually the natural things simply happen. They don't care about how we want to describe them. One has to keep that in mind in the background, so to speak, on top of that, what I just said. That means levels of our description of reality allow us to distinguish the things, different things that happen. Cause and effect can only occur or only occurs on the level of structure and information. The molecular levels and below it's unpredictable and random. And of course, now relating to us as humans, we are structure, so we can be causal. Also, the structure our mind controls, which is a structure as well, controls matter, controls our body, what we are doing, the freedom of action. The structure, of course, influences our decisions. That will actually be worked out in more detail in the last video of this philosophical part. And randomness, that's a little look ahead, so to speak, uses the freedom left and the free will uses the randomness left. So if you say we have free will, we are free to choose, then that's a random aspect. And that is tamed, so to speak, by the structure which imposes our personality. So that's a far look ahead that's discussed in much more detail in the last video of this philosophical parts of this video series. 
So we see that we can understand all these things on a very physical, very fundamental level. Of course, you can take other views, you can interpret things in a different way, but that's what I would like to, how I want to regard that, and that's how I then develop later on what actually we mean by consciousness on the one hand side and why we have free will and why we are responsible for those things that we are doing. Well, thank you for watching this video and I hope I see you again in one of the other videos.